Good morning. And welcome to our service of worship as we gather together on this Ascension Sunday as the Willow Grove United Methodist Church and especially on this Memorial Day weekend. Um, I know that many of us uh, come into the worship space um, this weekend with um, heavy hearts and heavy souls, um, thinking about the course of the events of this past week, uh, but for those that are also veterans carrying the weight and the burden of what that service has meant. And so we come into this space with a sense that God hears our prayers and knows our needs. And we welcome the opportunity to hear God speak to us in this space. As we acknowledge that, let us open with these words of urgency in our call to worship as Diane Delk helps lead us. Please stand as you are able and join me in the call to worship on this beautiful Sunday morning. Now, now is the time to wake from our sleeping. Now, now is the time for our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Please remain standing as you were able and join in our opening hymn, which is Here I Am, Lord, found in your pew Bible, or pew hymnal, on page 593.
and pray with me our opening prayer. Almighty and ever-loving God, we thank you that nothing at all can ever separate us from your amazing love and eternal grace, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Forgive us when overwhelmed by the pain of the world or in being too self-involved, that we lose sight of your connection to you, your promise and power. Help us to accept this truth in our hearts today and live in the strength of this promise. Amen. Our first scripture lesson is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 44 to 53, and can be found in your Pew Bible in the New Testament section on page 85. Jesus' Appearance and Ascension. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and see, I am sending upon you what my Father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany. And lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple blessing God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Our second scripture lesson is taken from the 8th and 13th chapter of Romans. Select verses from each of those chapters with the invitation to hear of the urgency of now. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with the sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For you are in the spirit. And since the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of its sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal body also through his spirit that dwells in you. And so, my brothers and sisters, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy of comparison with the glory that is about to be revealed to us. For if the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God, the creation was subject to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly, while we wait for adoption and the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, but who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. And likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good, for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. So what then are we to say about these things? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I, Paul, am convinced that neither life nor death, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
And as Paul continues sharing in his letter, reminding us that salvation is for all and that even our rejection at times is not final, that in Jesus there is new life. He shares the marks of a true Christian and continues saying, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now, the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone and the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we bring our hearts and minds and souls into your presence, help us to be aware of our breath. Help us to be aware of the simple gift of life that we are given this day. As we breathe in a breath of the fresh air that is provided so often even without our consciousness as we breathe out let us let go of the impurities that are within not just the physical impurities but the impurities that are in our thoughts and our minds in the blockades and the walls and barriers that we see. Help us now in this time to hear your special word provided for us this day. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. For now, now, now is the time to wake from sleeping. For now is the time because our salvation is nearer than when we even became believers. The theme of this year's annual conference was simply that, now. The conference was marked with a a sense of that urgency, the story of that urgency. Our conference, which took place just over a week ago, often defined that urgency in thinking about the totality of the work of the ministry of our church and all of the 400 churches of eastern Pennsylvania. The urgency and the call to now was an embracing of what has been the difficulty and the hardship, what has been the persecutions and trials, all of those things which Paul speaks of, and yet encouragement that we are to continue in this sense of urgency of now. I found that as I participated in the annual conference over the last couple of weeks throughout May, I had quite differing experiences of many of the different parts. A sense of incredible elation and a sense of an opportunity to return to norm as I gathered with over 175 clergy in Valley Forge in early May to hear the clergy as though they were just 
made believers, to hear them as though they were present even in their seminary days, singing in the four-part harmony of the opening and the closing hymns, it was overwhelming. That sense of what it means when we are corporately gathered in, in the glory and the fullness of who we know we are in Christ Jesus and even the fullness of who we know we are as the church. Many people sometimes ask me, you were at annual conference, right? What happened at that time in that session? And I often describe it simply as the opportunity that when perhaps during an, a year or the, the period of time in the fall when we take time to evaluate the membership and the ministry of our local church, it is that opportunity that we do it on a conference level. In particular, as the clergy gather, it is a calling of the role of the clergy. You see, as a reminder, my membership is not held here at the local church, but, but there with the clergy in that, that more global space of all of eastern Pennsylvania. And so it means the reading of the names of those that are making shifts in the ministry, those that are entering those that have passed away, those that are in the midst of a change of status, those that are retiring. It always gives me and a number of the others a real chuckle when it, we come to the part of that session where we actually have to stop and vote on the retirees. As if we voted no, perhaps they wouldn't retire anyway. But it is an acknowledgement and a sense of our corporate belonging one to another. Just a few weeks later, we had our larger session, which includes the totality of the annual conference. While the laity had also met in a separate online conversation some time before, much of the crux of our meeting together as a whole group of churches is around the celebration and the, the stopping and celebration of, of what the work of the church has been in the past year. In it, you see and you find the difficulties that not only you know you have been through, but also that other churches have been through also. What other churches have been through sometimes even exponentially multiplied by circumstances that hit their particular local community or context. While all of us very much felt corporately the weight of the pandemic and the shift in its challenges for all of us, the communities of Southwest Philadelphia and even those neighboring to us additionally hit by hurricanes that destroyed their communities, flooding that flooded out churches, but neighbors as well. And the way in which the church was the church and showed up. While there are often awards that are given moments of acknowledgement of particular ministries, I often find that they both inspire and yet often also challenge. Because they, like was the theme of the annual conference, they beg the question, are we responding to the urgency of now? What is the urgency of now for us as this particular community, for us as Willow Grove, for us as part of southeastern Pennsylvania? This year, when it came time to share in some of those awards an award that I don't remember us sharing in before, but was a bit more in or clear in its acknowledgement this year, was an award simply called the One Matters 
Award. The One Matters Discipleship Award. This particular award is given to United Methodist Churches through Discipleship Ministries and its agency that recommends churches each by their annual conference that have grown by at least one, perhaps only one, but have grown by one new member or profession of faith. The acknowledgement simply of the one acknowledges the significance that each of us bring to the table, the unique skills and set of skills, the questions and doubts that we bring, but also the story of faith that as we welcome even just one new person into the community of faith, how it shifts and changes and helps us all grow in our spiritual journey. This year in particular, it was the Clearview United Methodist Church on Buist Avenue in Philadelphia that was recognized. This particular church led by Reverend Suvette, Suzette Douglas Brown Despite its many challenges in the past year, despite all of the challenges of learning about online worship and services, celebrated in the gaining of 11 new members. In fact, one of the things that they celebrated and their district superintendent celebrated was in the individuals that have made this ministry something worth stopping to pay attention to is that the technology ministry is led by two young teens. Does that sound familiar? Do you see what we're doing at the back of the church? We've only just started, but one matters. The recommendation continued saying, and given what the pandemic has been and how our ministry has changed and is shaped, all of our musicians also happen to be under the age of 19 just now. During the pandemic, they founded that a new Friday night Bible study was built. It was one that was particularly needed and well responded to as this one specifically targeted those aged 18 to 30. So perhaps while all of the rest of us were taking our late after dinner nap, in this particular community, there was a sense of the opening, the need, the answer to a call that came on a Friday night. And the ministry was touching the heart of those young people there as it touched those who perhaps had those initial connections because it was a unique space that they felt heard and seen and known. They invited their friends. In fact, that particular ministry ended up, because we live in this strange world right now, ended up inviting participants from Texas and Georgia and California and Connecticut. Dear Willow Grove friends, does that sound familiar? While we are here in this physical space, here looking one at each other, sometimes I think we forget who sees us through that camera at the back of the sanctuary. What other states continue, even now, to join us? This past week, I had the opportunity to serve as your pastor and particularly make strong, significant pastoral connections with some of our eldest members. Ginny Bins has just returned from the hospital. She is home now. But in the course of the conversation and talking to Joyce, Joyce told me she's watching us. She's been watching that video in the day or the two days after. 
and she celebrated with me, and she laughed with me. She laughed at the things that we've laughed at, the humor of funny moments that have happened in our midst. She congratulated us and you for the work that you have done. You have committed to financially and with your time to improve the quality of that online service. She told me it was a market shift when we moved to the new technology. And for that, she's grateful. For while that connection started because of a hospitalization, it continues to connect us beyond that one to another. It helps us to be the body of Christ in stronger and more intimate ways. At annual conference, they continued talking about the Clearview United Methodist Church and gave thanks that even despite its challenges, that the Clearview Church has worked strongly and faithfully to meet all of its obligations, to pay its apportionments, to make sure that its pastor's pension was paid, that the property and liability insurance was paid, that they have been faithful in all things. And now that even though things have shifted and changed, they know that one of the things that has been renewed in this past year is a sense of who they are as a community as they pray with and for one another. And as they have done so, the ministry has been life-changing and vital. As the Herbert Palmer Urban Ministry Awards were also shared, other communities like Eastwick and South Philadelphia were recognized, particularly amongst the work that they done and something that reminded me of work that we too must celebrate here is they, sp they spoke to the work of how they opened their space for clinics and vaccinations, how they worked to be hands and feet of Jesus as they cared for the physical health of their members. And while we here in Willow Grove did not particularly host vaccinations, there was concerted effort so that no person was left behind. If it was too difficult to figure out how to online register, people volunteered to drive or to help make reservations. And just to the same, as Eastwick opened its food bank and worked to serve and partner with 4,000 families a year, you here in Willow Grove gave over two and a half thousand dollars to the Montgomery County Anti-Hunger Network. And you consistently did food drives, especially as we were asked and was most desperately needed by the Willow Grove Baptist Church, serving members and community persons whom we have known for a long time. And we, like this church, and so many of our churches all across the conference, continue to look and to request that God continue to lead us and guide us in these challenging times. That there would be clarity about our what next. That there would be clarity in the midst of headlines that can steal all of our joy or all of our sense of God's agency and power working within us. And yet the message of this day is the reminder that if God is for us, then who, who can be against us? If we are living in the spirit of Christ Jesus, can any of these hardships crush us? 
And while perhaps we have felt crushed individually, when we find our way back to connection with God and connection with the community, the grace which is revealed to us, which has embraced us, is overwhelming. And that, that, my friends, is the story that we must tell. That, my friends, is the story we must tell of the grace that embraces us, of the God who has gone before us, the God who has paved for us a journey in in glory. For shall we be convinced, are you convinced, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will separate you from Christ Jesus. Let us open our hearts to the light. Let us open our witness of the ministry of the church to the light. And may we be made new in God's image. Amen. Let us stand now and join together in our hymn of response. Rejoice ye pure in heart.
As we move into our time of prayer this morning, um, I would like to start by doing this uh, a little bit differently. Um, I wanted to start and begin, instead of perhaps beginning with specific updates of our members, which I'd be happy to share um, a little bit, a little bit further along, but I would like to start thinking of larger um, parts of our society or community and then offering an open, short opportunity for you to lift up simply a name uh, for whom that reminds you of or for whom you would like to ask for prayer. So in particular, as I think about a couple of different parts um, of this weekend, um, as I think particularly about uh, the secular celebration, but often which has had important, um, important, important rituals also within our faith communities, um, I remember that it is Memorial Day this weekend, um, and that one of the most public witnesses to Memorial Day are often Memorial Day parades uh, throughout, throughout our local communities and sometimes even throughout our cities. And as a part of that, um, we often will see different uh, branches of the military or um, different parts of the military and veterans that march one with another or um, in particular, perhaps other civil servants and scout troops um, that come together. And that while those people gather um, and those people sometimes march in the parade, they also point us towards something else beyond which is their comrades that have fallen. And so um, as an example of how I would like to open this and ask if you have any particular names, um, are there names of any particular veterans or some of their comrades for whom you would lift up um, this day or branches of the service? Um, so as a part of that, I would recognize uh, my father who was a veteran um, of Vietnam and particularly on whom this weekend always acknowledges and recognizes his comrade Wilbert Hines. So for Stanley Crawl and his comrade Wilbert Hines. Are there other veterans and their comrades which you might hope to recognize? Can't believe you guys are so quiet. Yep, Rich. Okay, so Rich, for your father, Norman, and for your uncle, what was your uncle's name? Charles, and both who were veterans of World War II. And we remember, and what branch of the service did each of them serve in? Okay, who were both in the army and for whom we remember not just them in their service, but the comrades that they served with. Thank you. For who else would you recognize? Diane? so I was trying to write really fast. <laughs> um, so for your father, Diane, William Troxell, um, who served in World War II, and for two of his best friends, Robert and Jay, whose names you don't particularly remember, but after whom one or both of your brothers? Both of your brothers were actually named if one brother was named after both of those fallen comrades. Thank you. See, and I think that's what I mean about how the memory lives with us, right? Thank you very much. Are there others? Um, Don. Your brother-in-law, Dennis, uh, was a Vietnam veteran. Thank you very much. And did I see Mary Lou, your hands, or Jane's hands? Jane? Mm -hmm. 
for whom he would want to acknowledge as well. So for Alf, who was in the army and um, would have would have been also a World War II vet, with Korea, that's right, he was right in between, wasn't he? Yep, okay, Korea. And for whom we remember and acknowledge that at that time, the whole neighborhood would have been, um, yeah, would have been uh, dr drafted or would have been sent together. And also your son, Jim, who um, attended West Point and would have many people whom he would want to remember as well. Are there others? Heather. Okay, so I got your dad served in World War II in the Army Air Corps. And remind me again of Ernie, of course, yes. And then who else did you say? Oh, Uncle Ernie was in Korea. Gotcha. Will. Okay, we have Roger Worthman. Okay, so that's probably Ray's father, yeah, I would think. Yeah, we have Does Roger Worthman, Robert Worthman, Richard Worthman, who are all veterans from the Marine and Army. So who are all veterans from, say it one more Marine time. Marine and Army. Oh, the Marines and the Army. Okay. Very good. Kim. So I caught a couple of those names, Kim. I didn't quite catch all of them, and I'm not sure I'll be able to repeat them like really well, but will you catch me afterwards to make sure that you share with me? I think as I was counting, I think I counted about at least five extended family members that have served in one way, shape, or form. Thank you very much. Carolyn? So you see, I think I caught it right, and yet I don't know that I realized um, how deep some of the civil servant roots in this particular congregation run. Um, it's really quite significant if you see it. Mary Lou? Mm -hmm. Right. Both of your brothers were in the service, and then what was the third one? And brother-in-law, so both bro brothers and brother brother-in-law. Yeah. Thank you, Janet. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. So from a large family of twelve six in the service yeah so one of the things that was really powerful actually oh i see one more cheryl go ahead So for your father, ex-husband, and son-in-law who actually serves in the National Guard. Army, Army, sorry. 
I think I'm thinking of the Donnellys. Don't the Donnellys have some, I think, um, uh, national service? Ian, Ian, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, Priscilla? Okay. Thank you. Gary? So um, I don't actually want to stop us, but I would invite those of you that actually did offer some names. I think this is actually a really powerful list of how we're connected. And so if you take a piece of scrap paper and help write some of those names down, um, I think right now I'm trying to be conscious of another part of our congregation that probably can't hear you um, and might be getting a little bit frustrated um, only because I think they would want to hear some of those stories and some of those connections. Um, for those that are online, I, I want to acknowledge that it's probably been really, really hard to hear um, just now. Um, but I think one of the things that I was also struck by is that um, in light of actually the celebration and actually acknowledgement of Doris Hardcastle this past week um, as being recognized as a lifetime member of the Upper Moreland Historical Association. Um, that acknowledgement actually happened at the beginning of the program that they offered um, for, for this month. And um, they do these once a month, these historical association um, kind of lectures or educational events. Um, and the particular subject matter uh, for this month's meeting was actually a unique thing about the Battle of Gettysburg and the history of the Battle of Gettysburg, which is a part of the story which is not always told very often or not told very frequently. Um, and in particular, the, the presenter shared about the 50th reunion gathering of veterans of the Civil War on the field of the Battle of Gettysburg. So part of what was really incredible to kind of think about was um, what he shared about the particular commitment that the state of Pennsylvania or the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania made uh, for this um, celebration or reunion to actually happen. Many of the soldiers who would have fought during the Civil War would have been in their late teens into their 20s, maybe into their 30s, but really they were very young men. And while there had been other reunions throughout the many years following the Civil War, oftentimes in particular regions or when monuments perhaps were being um, put together and were very, very regional, this particular event was very much one of a kind in as much as any person who was a surviving member and could prove in a documented way that they had served in the Civil War, either on the Union side or even as a Confederate soldier, were invited to come to this. Um, as you can imagine, they envisioned that there could potentially be uh, conflicts that would arise, and yet it seemed um, a really important thing to acknowledge and to do. And so while the Battle of Gettysburg, and, and this is so staggering to me, only having really visited for the first time and spent um, meaningful adult time there, that on the field, uh, the battlefield between the Confederate and the Union soldiers, there would have been over 160,000 persons on the field on either or other of the side. When the 50th reunion happened, though not perhaps everybody had participated in that battle, but were in some way connected to the Civil War. 
and to acknowledge that the average age lifespan of a man was 55. And most of these soldiers would have been in their 70s and their 80s. There were over 58,000 veterans that gathered 50 years later. 58,000 veterans that gathered. And while it was heavily weighted towards there being um, Union soldiers that made up most of those that gathered, one of the things that was really extraordinary and that they shared was that even where there was um, a reenactment of, of one of the lines of defense in a particular part of the battle, that when the men finally came across to the place where they would have shed blood with one another, where they would have killed the other young men on the other side, at the end of it all, they embraced. Because they had seen something, they had witnessed something um, that had changed their entire life. Um, and, and it was a really powerful way to, to acknowledge that what lives in us lives, lives not just from our own personal experience, but in the corporate experience of many that have come before us. And that sometimes that story is deeply incorporated in ways that, that help us make very good and meaningful and powerful and life-giving decisions. And there are times that some of that stuff lives in us that is really not of God's spirit. And, um... And that really, in the end, we are all in the awe of our creator who has given us life and who has given us breath. Well, I, I'm not sure I expected that once we opened up to, to share um, and to take the time that it did. I really feel like I would be remiss if I didn't also acknowledge um, the school shooting that happened in Texas but also during our corporate worship over the last couple of weeks, we also haven't acknowledged some of the other mass shootings that have happened um, at the supermarket in Buffalo and, and many other places. And so as we think about this kind of violence that is in our community, I ask you specifically um, if you will think about what schools you are praying for, what communities you are praying for, what teachers, what students, what local officials or perhaps um, mental health professionals, local police, or even how we can uniquely create action towards change. Um, I would ask you to think about those prayers. Um, and so I hope maybe you'll take a moment and if you would write some of those down for me rather than us uh, moving into the naming of all those, perhaps maybe we could name those um, next week. But let us bow our head in prayer. Gracious God, we stand awed when we acknowledge and witness the power of your creation, the power of the winds and the rains and the storms that can come. We stand in awe when they can come across our communities and destroy things in a matter of moments yet acknowledge that we too often have taken for granted that water is a source of life, that clean water not only nourishes our body, but it nourishes the earth. And so we pray for your creation and the healing of creation, the acknowledgement of ways that we can tread lightly here on this earth, and utilize it not for our own purposes, but in harmony with the rest of creation as well. We lift up particular those of our membership that have been ill or hospitalized, or perhaps have undergone procedures or treatments this past week, 
We give thanks for the hands of doctors and nurses and practitioners and all allied health professionals whom help us to understand often when we do not understand clearly some of the things that are happening in our physical bodies or the bodies of the ones whom we love. Help us to ask good questions be patient when long answers are long coming and give us strength to be present in the here and the now as you call us to be. We lift up before you those who have served in many different parts of the armed services or who also serve as civil servants today and have in the past. Too often we do not remember or acknowledge the sacrifice that this service means. Perhaps not so much in as much as simply the gift of life, but in the holding of that calling, how it challenges our individual desires in consultation with ethics that are for the larger whole, a reminder of a brotherhood and a sisterhood that sometimes in our society too often is given way for what is best simply just for me. We have named many persons and we give thanks for their service, but especially in this day we give Thanks for the burdens that they have carried, often quite silently, as they have asked questions about their service, the validity of their service, perhaps actions that they have had to take, including taking the lives of others for whom even looking into their eyes, they acknowledge that they too have families though they may be on enemy lines. We do not know all of the hardship that often has been in the midst of that service and many have suffered silently for many years. May we be persons who are open and willing to hear the vulnerabilities of the questions that they ask and also remind them and share with them the gift of God's presence with them. We especially also ask for prayers for all of those who have been affected by the mass shootings that have so covered the headlines of our days. But as much as we ask for prayers for these headlines and shootings, Lord, we also ask for prayers and for acknowledgement of those too often which go by silently and each and every day, many times even within our own communities. Help us, Lord, to see a new way. Help us to confront the violence in our society as an end to all means. Help us to recommit ourselves to the upbuilding of our society, to mentoring relationships and friendships, and the acknowledgement of those who are alone. And when we have become paralyzed, Lord, when we have become paralyzed, Lord, be present with us there too. Be present with us when we have become desensitized because it is all too overwhelming. And we have perhaps come to feel paralyzed and helpless and hopeless speak as much and as strongly into those places and those spaces 
May they be the fertile ground where you drop seeds for ministry that is to come, for witness that has not yet erupted, but that comes. As Jesus speaks to us and reminds us that the Spirit of the Lord was upon him, and it is upon us to offer release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed. We ask this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As we move into our offering, I would invite you um, at your own opportunity and pace to please go ahead and review our announcements. Um, we have three quarters of the summer completed. Uh, we've put a call out to all of our musicians and our soloists and our singers. We still have a couple of empty slots um, through part of the summer, so please be in touch with Diane or myself or Alex um, if you haven't yet signed up, uh, but would like to push yourself a little bit and grow in that way as well. Uh, we very much would love the opportunity to include um, um, everyone in that opportunity. Um, I would invite you also to look over um, some of our announcements about an opportunity to serve as the hospitality tent at Juneteenth. Um, we are looking for about 10 to 12 uh, people who can be present. We're gonna break it up into shifts if you did not get a Willow Grove volunteer t-shirt, we are about to make a reorder on those t-shirts. Or if you just want one and you don't have one yet, please see me. Um, I'm gonna be picking out the sizes uh, this coming week, so please let me know about that. Also, we're looking forward to the way that our outdoor worship service is coming together uh, for June the 26th. And please reach out to Kim Swalje or uh, Terry Soltis to see how you can uh, perhaps help out with that as well. Um, please check in on a couple of the other announcements uh, that are there as well. Um, and especially, please send those celebrations and milestone graduations that are coming up in these next couple of days off to the office. Um, with that said, let us receive our morning tithes and offerings.
give thanks for all that you have blessed us with in life. And we offer these as the first fruits of that which we have received. May they be used faithfully for the work of your ministry and the upbuilding of your kingdom here in this place. Be present with us even in this day, even in this, these struggles, even in these challenges. May we know your presence with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us close then together with our hymn, Go Make of All Disciples, on page 571. but also the obedience of faith through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen.